welcome to Things Are Getting Strange in X-Files We Watch podcast. I'm Nick. And Adune Vaso Baragas. I am Kim. I forgot, I completely forgot I asked you to do that. So that was the universal greeting again, as originally depicted in EVE. Yep, you asked for it, so I found it again. Okay, so we, you find us at the start of Season 2 with very little new wave exiles news, as usual. Yeah, I don't <laughs> have anything to add. I was spent all my creativity last week asking people for their opinions on Season 1. I need to think of some things to talk to people about Season 2 about, I think. It's fine. Well, eventually we'll get to the point where we can ask them what their favourite episodes of Season 2 are, which I think is a much harder call than Season 1. Yeah, from what I remember, we're getting closer to the series in its heyday now. Oh, yeah. And, um, well, I suppose without further ado, we can get on to the episodes, unless you want to talk about your eBay acquisitions or anything. Oh, uh, that's if I win my bid, please, nobody snipe my bid at the moment. Just trying to win myself copies of all of the um, anthologies of X-Files short stories at the moment. Though I did also manage to stand my copy of The Extraterrestrial's Guide to the X-Files. Just because, Nick, I think you've brought it up about half a dozen times so far, and now I can read it. Maybe once or twice. I can now understand. I'll get the references. It's a, it's a very silly book, and I think it was only written in, like, in season two kind of time period. Yeah, I've just been scouring eBay for anything I can get at the moment. As you're aware, I've been collecting the um, young adult and middle grade novels. Though, if anyone can hook me up on copies of Ascension or Colony, I'd be very grateful because I can't find those anywhere. Yeah, and also a long shot, but we might as well ask at long last. It's a case of if anyone actually knows Catatonia or how to get hold of Catatonia, we'd actually love to use the relevant song as theme music, but, you know, it's probably a bit more complicated than that. But if anyone does know Catatonia, please tell us. If you do know Catatonia or can hook me up on any of the X-Files novels that I cannot find anywhere, I would be very grateful. So I suppose we will get to uh, the episodes of the week. So we start a season two. And we start with Little Green Men. First broadcast on the 16th of September 1994, written by Glenn Morgan and James Wong. Three. And written by David Nutter. So, uh, the first two guest stars, I think we're going to stop mentioning from this point onwards, given we know they recur quite a lot, and by now you know who they are, we've gone over what they've done. So that's William B. Davis and Mitch Pileggi. They're in it again, they're going to be in it a lot from this point onwards. The Cigarette Smoking Man and uh, Walter Skinner. Exactly. Of more interest, though, we have Vanessa Morley, who plays Samantha Mulder. She will, um, oddly enough, and I really didn't remember it being like this, she will won't appear again until season four, in which case, in which point she gets four episodes. Okay. So she gets to be, she'll be in Heron Volk, Paper Hearts, Memento Mori, and Demons. She also hilariously is a dub voice on Mobile Suit Gundam Seed, uh, Kagali Yula Atha, if I'm um, reading this correctly. I just thought it was very interesting. Yeah, another X Files actor has gone into dub work. Oh, fair enough. And and this is the kind of ironic one I liked. She will show up in X Files. I want to believe the second film. Oh, right. As a random FBI agent who doesn't get a name. Oh. But Samantha Mulder will show up in the second film. Is it actually her and Mulder's just really unobservant? We can hope. I mean, <laughs> I, I think uh, that's a probably a better fate than the one we think she's going to get. Um, also, we have Raymond J. Barry as Richard Matheson, who will appear twice more in the X-Files, not once more, because he actually gets a second appearance. Sorry, a third appearance, which I'd forgotten about. Because you remembered SR-819. Yeah, he's definitely in that one. He's also in Nisai in season three. Is he? Oh, we'll see when we get yeah, to I know, it. Yeah, I know. I've forgotten he was in there at all. Uh, hilariously, and I can't remember who this is, but I suspect he's one of the bullies, but he's in Cool Runnings. I suspect he's part of the Swedish squad. German. The, oh, German. Yeah, I suspect he's one of the German. Funny if so. And, of course, he was in Frasier. I didn't get a character name for this one, but he's in Frasier. Do we just assume from this point on that everyone is? I'll, I'll have to double check. <laughs> and we are the last uh, guest star for this week, uh, for this episode, sorry, is Mike Gomez, who plays Jorge Concepcion, if I'm reading this right. Concepcion. He's the man Mulder meets at Arecibo, then, I presume. He is. He's been on Star Trek Next Generation twice and was also in The Big Lebowski as Auto Circus Cop. And I have no idea who that was. I'll have to look, keep an eye out for him next time. Synopsis for Little Green Men. 
A signal is received in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, indicating a response from an extraterrestrial intelligence. After the closure of the X-Files, Mulder and Scully have been assigned to different areas. Scully is teaching at the FBI Academy, while Mulder is conducting low-level wiretaps. The pair meet in the parking lot of the Watergate Hotel, where Mulder admits he is beginning to doubt his belief in the paranormal after Deep Throat's death. Mulder then has a flashback to the events of Samantha's abduction. Awoken from a dream, Mulder is summoned to talk to Senator Richard Matheson, who is a patron of Mulder's work. He tells Mulder of the signal at the start that's received in Arecibo, and he will try to interfere with the Blue Beret UFO crash retrieval team, who will be heading there in 24 hours. Upon reaching the facility, Mulder meets Jorge, who is terrified and cannot speak English. When prompted, he draws a picture resembling a grey alien. Scully tries to locate Mulder, and finds the signal provided by Matheson, and spots Mulder's alias on a flight itinerary. Mulder checks over the received signals at Arecibo, but Jorge panics and flees into the storm. When Mulder finds him, he has died of fright. Scully evades tracking at the airport and follows Mulder to Puerto Rico. Mulder examines Jorge's body as night falls, while effects similar to Samantha's abduction begin to play out around him. He tries and fails to shoot at an alien silhouette in the doorway of the facility. Scully awakes him the next morning, and Mulder is excited but is forced to flee when the Blue Beret crash retrieval team arrive, and he can only take one tape with him. Mulder is disciplined on his return to Washington by Skinner and Cigarette Smoking Man. Mulder claims his time was being wasted because he has ample evidence collected to, on his official stakeout. When Cancer Man gloats, Skinner throws him out of his office, and Mulder escapes disciplinary action for now. Mulder excitedly tries the tape he retrieved from Arecibo, but discovers it is blank, and this is potentially due to a power surge during the electrical storm the night before. But newly motivated, Mulder intends to continue his pursuit of the paranormal. So, it's a new season starts off with a bit of a bang. Yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised because based on what I read of reviews at the time this came out, it was kind of came out to mixed opinions. Apparently it wasn't what people expected from the X-Files, which is strange because I think it's a really strong opening for a series. Yes, well, actually I had a thought about that and I think I know possibly why it's not what people wanted, but I think I know why they did it. Okay, what do you reckon they wanted? I made a point in season one of saying that Pilot was obviously a pilot for the series. Mm -hmm. Deep Throat was a second pilot because basically you can come on with Deep Throat without knowing anything of what happened in pilot yeah this is pilot number three this is your onboarding point the last one you're probably going to get as well for the x-files of you can come in with almost no knowledge of the previous season pick everything up very quickly and get on with it i suppose other than the knowledge of who deep throat was is the only thing you're really lacking coming on at this point yeah and given that he's kind of tied away in one conversation it's a th it's kind of thing where you can pick up a season two of something and you can get just enough of just of season one to not have to see it first it seems strange to say this is disappointing though in a way oh, given yeah. that it's things like we see our first alien in this episode <laughs> and stuff like that that our first alien that isn't a possibly fake fetus in a jar or something like that or you know an amish person although we do have to we have to question if we're gonna, we're gonna leap to the alien i suppose we're gonna have to what is it doing Really? It's dancing! It's dancing in the doorway. Twice. Twice. I mean, the music choice does not help, because that sounds like a really sort of apocalyptic disco beat it's got going when it's in the doorway. They did design the aliens in this episode to be minimalist, from what I could tell from when I read about it, is they wanted it to be instantly recognisable as what you would think an alien is, where, you know, obviously the most kind of well-known image is the grey alien with the um, oval-shaped face and the big eyes. So they went with that and they didn't want to push it too far because they didn't want it to look unrealistic. So it's just they have their actor dressed as a grey alien and they've stretched the image somewhat, yeah. which is what gives you your kind of gangly dance that you like to laugh at. But it, it's just it's slowly swaying to the music, the apocalyptic beats of um, Mark Snow. It's still creepy, though. It is still creepy, but I can't... I, I, I should find it creepier than I do because it really freaks me out. I mean, for reference, we watched VHS, uh, well, most of the VHS films yesterday. And VHS 2 ends with a potentially terrifying... The alien story. sleepover. Yeah. One. I suppose they, they also do look a lot like grey aliens, but they, they move in a lot more animalistic way. Yeah, it's also, they're also very aggressive. Yeah. M much more so than you'd get in, um, well, in this, for example. 
Yeah, I suppose you've got that too. But I suppose that's an idea of you've done the same way of the silhouetted alien in the doorway, but they're incredibly scary in that version. Yeah, whereas the X-Files one is kind of mysterious. I mean, to also dwell on the aliens a bit, they make that connection to the telescope. It was a telescope, wasn't it, that the guy built when he was visited by elves? Yes. And we're presumably meant to think that was a kind of delusion he had. But, I mean, you could also make the whole supernatural connection of seeing spirits and seeing aliens and the two not being as distinct apart as you'd like them to be. I also like the kind of parallel with Mulder's madness there. It's like, the, yeah, people might think this guy's crazy, but in the end, he made something functional yeah. out of this. Whether Mulder will do the same is the matter. Whether the elves or aliens existed mm. is a moot point because he did create something wonderful even though he may have been insane. Yes. I mean, I wouldn't like to guess what Maul's going to do at the end of this, because I don't think he's going to produce something uh, quite as exquisite. I do think it's also interesting that in both times we see the alien in flashback and in present day, Maul's uh, immediately goes for a weapon. He really wants to see aliens and everything, but if he does, he's going to freak out and try and kill it. Maybe you've got that idea of... We all kind of want to see the supernatural, but when faced with it, how much do yeah. you really want to see it? Very little. I did think it was interesting as well, if we're going to do it, uh, is we have alien... We've reached alien interference with electronics. Now we've got aliens apparently influencing physical objects. Because we've got that computer gets tossed away from the doorway and unlocks itself on the inside. Mm. The door in Mulder's house opens on its own and his gun refuses to work. It's true. We've had an idea of them being psychic before, though, in the way that they can control people in the pilot and in um, oh, the one with Max, Fallen Angel. Yeah. So them being able to move things telekinetically is probably not out of the range of possibility. You have that almost Lovecraftian idea with Jorge as well, with um, you can die of fright. So whatever he saw was so terrible, his heart just stopped. Yeah, although that does call into question, what were the aliens doing? Because apparently they seem to have landed in it. Well, they seem to have seen on Arecibo. Mm. landed near Arecibo, Jorge spotted one of them, that's terrified him so he's barricaded himself in the bathroom. Then they've taken off, so Mulder turns up, then Jorge gets freaked out and rushes out into the, into the night. They've landed somewhere nearby and they're wandering around so that Jorge can see them. Freaks himself out. Jorge's already very agitated though, he's not in the best of way, he's malnourished, yeah, he's he been there an unspecific time, so... It possibly wouldn't take a lot to give him a heart attack at this stage. True. And I think charitably you can say he didn't necessarily see anything actually out in that storm. He just thought he saw something. Trick of the light or some a, a simulacrum. My only thing with that would be how quickly he went into rigor. Because optimistically Mulder says within half an hour, but it feels a lot faster than that in the episode. Yeah, I think you can give them some leeway for the whole they've cut out the half an hour between him leaving the control room and actually But at the him. same time, Rigor doesn't normally sit in until like a few hours have passed. Yeah. Even, you know, Rigor can set in faster according, again, to my weird search history through doing this podcast <laughs> that is going to get me in trouble one day. Rigor can set in faster if you're in a bad condition, which Jorge is, mm. but it still seems really, really fast for it to be within half an hour. He's absolutely stiff dead. Yeah. There's also the weirdness of the episode where Mulder enters the facility he has to cut through all the he has to go around the chain link fence and everything and goes all the plastic sheets on the computers and says there's no evidence anyone has been here for a while I can't remember what time frame he gives it and then after a quarter of an hour he finds Jorge locked in the bathroom <laughs> in this case of to well, be fair he doesn't look in the bathroom true but so I said Mulder I'm going to be skeptical of your observational powers if you've said there's no evidence of anyone being here oh yeah he's in the bathroom this is Fox Mulder with his photographic memory as well. They really have let that one slide, haven't they? I don't think that's come up once since. Unless I can't think that coming up again. He's good at his job, but you don't get the idea of the eidetic memory at all. No, no. We're skipping ahead. We should probably go back we to the start. We should probably go to the start. Yep. We get to see Mordor and Scully separately again. And the thing is, Scully seems to be happier in how she's landed because I think it's the whole, she's not being punished. She's being given a role that's suitable for her qualifications. Back to a teaching do job at Quantico. Yeah, while Mulder gets to do crap work, basically. This wiretap of mafioso, I think it's implied to be, who are having the most tedious conversations on the phone. At least he gets to sit down and eat lots of his sunflower seeds. He does, but he hates all of it. <laughs> the, the, her study autopsy, though, is one of those moments that I imagine 
someone thought, or sorry, obviously Morgan and Wong thought that's going to be kind of nice of having her do the whole sort of weird philosophical tangent. And then her student saying, oh, Scully, that sounds a bit spooky. It's a case of, really? Really? In 1994, is anyone going to say that's a bit spooky? I think we're coming to regret giving Mulder that nickname because <laughs> it never sounds are. natural in conversation. <laughs> no. Very appropriate they meet at the Watergate Hotel, not just because of Deep Throat and because of Richard Nixon, and that's the circumstances when, uh, Sc- not Scully, Samantha got abducted. You also see in that scene that Scully is coping way better than Mulder is in this. M- Mulder's gone from being desperate to find the truth to having given up on that real fast and being ultra paranoid. But we'll only meet with her covertly and things like that. Yeah, I don't. And also, the Scully's doing all her best to avoid detection and everything. I don't think they do a bad job of actually reconciling Mulder's kind of gung ho way he ended season one with the whole he's come down fast. Because I'm guessing it's he's discovering how fast or how much he's lost when he's been reassigned away from the X-Files, how much leeway he had and how many resources he could throw at stuff. And now he's actually have to do stuff at the best of someone else. It's not going so well. We should probably mention that there's the infamous inconsistency in the abduction story. In ha- Samantha's abduction. Yeah, and how conduit posits this happens and how Logie Men posits this happens. Chris Carter will ex- has the excuse that this is because one is based on what actually happens of one of the recovered memories. Which is fair. Which is fair. Glenn Morgan has a different reason. Okay. Which is they didn't watch Conduit. <laughs> and apparently <laughs> this brought to his attention so he went to their office afterwards and said why didn't you say anything this is really embarrassing so it's an inconsistency they've excused but it's in there purely because someone didn't watch one of the episodes i think it works with the chris carter excuse it though even it if does. it is just an excuse because that's kind of what we put into people's heads back in born again yes is the idea that regression hypnosis isn't is it that good yeah well not that good it isn't always the best tool and it isn't always reliable yeah and it's a throwaway line but i kind of like it Walter says he attended deep Throat's funeral via binoculars i mean you have to tell to where this was more because that's an in- fascinating detail that you actually figured out that this was happening and could do it via binoculars who could observe what was happening given how high up deep throat is you've got to assume it was an arlington funeral or something like that yeah it's, it's how secretive and i think the other question is who else was there? I mean, that's a potentially fascinating cross-section of the intelligence community could be at this funeral. When you look down there and you see how many high-ranking FBI agents are in the audience or yeah, something. but I think the one thing that possibly no one has considered at the time or no one was interested in answering is Mordor has attended this funeral by binoculars and we're going to conjecture it was Arlington or someone, one of these big American cemeteries where you put the military and um, other big Political people. Political people. Yeah. Okay, Mulder, so you witnessed his um, funeral, so you didn't go to his graveside and find out who he was. It just says Deep Throat on it the just tombstone. Says Deep Throat. <laughs> wow, his name was Reginald Deep Throat all along. <laughs> oh my god. A name that he never used himself once. Well, it's just to draw the kind of connection to the Watergate Deep Throat, isn't it? It's true, though Mulder will use it in this episode to actually refer to him, which then gets a bit weird, doesn't it? Going back to the abduction, so we also have... Some interesting bits and pieces. Young Samantha, uh, long last, who looks uh, a bit different to her photo. I think they've, well, this is her first appearance in the series, so she's been recast at least once by now. And they're playing Stratejo. While watching The Magician. Well, no, they're waiting, waiting for, the for the magician. They're watching start. the Watergate tape files. Yeah. So this is all to if, do with If you read the graphic novels, Mulder's still fixated on The Magician. Yeah. It's his alias when they go into <laughs> deep cover. Which is cool. Um, so a few details that I want to sort of um, note. So this abduction happens, all the room shaking, all the bright lights and everything, and the parents are next door. It's like, wow, the aliens are stealthy or everyone else is just blind and deaf. It could be one of those weird science things is that it's all isolated. It but if be. you're not within the house, you're not experiencing this. True. Although you, the, the amount of flashing lights the ship... The Child ship levitating <laughs> out the window. Well, that's the other point. It's a case of... I can't decide what's going on with the abduction because the alien comes in the doorway. Okay, you'd think they'd sort of come in, pick her up and carry her out or something. But no, the alien's going to pose in the doorway and dance while Samantha levitates out of a window. It's a case of, did you have to come in? Could you not stay on the ship? Is this what you do for fun? Wasn't you? 
well, maybe, actually, yeah, this is a this is the thing in the Extraterrestrial Guide to the X Files, after all. But it's also Fallen Angel has demonstrated you actually have teleportation. You could have just beamed her up rather than floating her out of a window. I know it makes for a great visual and everything. I'm thinking it's more like that Simpsons episode where they hose him down with whiskey before they dump him again, exactly. so he comes across as looking crazy. Well, that that's also in the Extraterrestrial Guide to the X Files case of I don't they forced me to drink fourteen shots of malt liquor, and I don't remember anything after that. Come on, aliens! You can you can discredit every witness. It's fine. Senator Matheson, though. So this is Mulder's contact in Congress, the person who's been helping him out, who was referred to in pilot and then has not been mentioned since until now. Um, I have a note on this guy. I imagine it's the same as the trivia I found out about this guy. Was it that he? is a tribute to Richard Matheson, who wrote many episodes of Twilight Zone. Yep. Who was uh, also supposed to do the opening commentary on this episode, but they couldn't get him. Yep. And was meant to be played by Darren McGiven, who was Coltrack the Night Stalker, but they could not get him in for this role. Correct. They will try tw- They will try twice more to get um, Daniel McGiven into a role and succeed one time. But we'll talk about more about that later. I love the use of the Brandenburg Concerto through the Senator Matheson scene as well, with its importance being the first song on the um, Voyager 1 gold disc. I kind of like it as the, um, whether he makes a good point of, you know, if this is the scope of humanity you're going to present to the universe, it's actually a pretty good Mm. representation thing. On the other hand, it did kind of feel this time in a way that I'd noticed before that we're being bludgeoned with it because they're making really sure that, you know, it was on the Voyager disc. Every opportunity is, yes, this was the first track on the Voyager disc. If someone picks it up and plays it, this is what they're going to hear first. Mm. Just to make sure we really understand why we're going to get it played to us later. I like the paranoia as well, though, where he's uh, right, he's presenting to talk to Mulder about Bach. And it's one of these things where you have to wonder about wiretaps. It's a case of, I understand there's a limit to what you can do when you're observing someone like this, but when case of, okay, so Richard Matheson has dragged disgraced FBI agent Fox Mulder into his office to talk about Bach for half an hour. To listen to the full movement from the concerto (laughs) twice. And then Mulder just leaves the country. (laughs) We're not going to make any connection there at all. And we got the Blue Beret Crass Retrieval team, uh, which also, it makes me wonder, because Fallen Angel was written by the same pair who wrote Conduit. Mm. Did Glenn Morgan and James Wong not watch any other episode of the X-Files when they were writing things? You kind of have them in Fallen Angel. It, you do, but they're, they're not, not named. Quite, and they're not as aggressive either. No, but it strikes me as you could have you could have linked that again. That's not easy linkage back again. Yeah. But this is the same group that Mordor's tangled with before. It's very clearly not the same group. But... No, but it's also kind of, it doesn't make sense for them not to be the same group. Because no. they're, they're doing exactly the same thing. And there can't be that many of them. How many UFO crashes are we having? Well, obviously you have seven crash retrieval teams one for each color this is the blue one okay so you have red beret crash retrieval team so maybe it was the red team last time (laughs) it could have been and i'm guessing well maybe no one thought we could get um oh the commander back in again so interesting also for paranoia is straight after this we get really oddly a tape of skinner talking to scully about Mulder's whereabouts being listened to by uh skinner and it turns out it's his uh, secret smoky man is asking where Mulder's gone to. And also Councilman is apparently an advocate for Morley cigarettes because he's really disappointed if you don't smoke. I like that as a kind of small insubordination. Yeah. Is, you know, Skinner is not so under the thumb that he will do everything Councilman asks, including accepting <laughs> the so cigarette. Yeah. It's the small rebellion that shows that Skinner isn't entirely on his side. Yeah, well, which will come in at the end of the episode when Skinner very abruptly just stands up to cancer man when he starts gloating more so in the host too but we'll get to that in a little while yeah i've got to wonder and it's this is one of these things where 90s technology kind of clashes with possible referencing so mulder has got a dictaphone that he's talking on skinny scully's done this in the past but you've got to wonder if this is a twin peaks nod yeah because it's to the un, un, unseen female um friend that he's going to send this tape to afterwards yeah of course Scully's also still really great at guessing passwords in this one. She is. I mean, I, I do remember that after this episode, basically, if you found an X-Files fan and they had a password on their computer, because this is before Windows used to enforce that kind of thing, is you'd have a pretty decent chance of getting access to someone's <laughs> files if you tried to trust no one. Or trust number one, as you say it. Trust number one. Yep. 
I did like her wrong guesses, though, which are Spooky and Samantha, respectively. Both terrible passwords, but... It's the um, movie hacking thing where you've got to get it wrong twice before you get it right. Scully apparently could have a career in stage magic, because she's pretty good with that printout. Oh, I like the feeding the fish bit as well. It's a good What's he doing in here? Oh, uh, when Mulder's away, I feed his fish. <laughs> yeah. So, Scully, are there fish in that tank? I can't quite see. It's great that we're seeing Scully kind of getting more in this, though. Uh, yeah. The Scully at the start of season one would have immediately given in and told those kind of men in black everything she knew. That's true, yeah. She's compared- far more on side and far more thinking like Mulder in the same way. He's kind of accepting that he needs evidence now, and he's thinking more like Scully. Yeah, oh yeah, contrast this to Conduit, where she threw the family under the bus when she was told to. It's how many times in early season one she throws Mulder under the bus too. She'll only go with him so far, and now you're getting more the feeling of she's got Mulder's back all the way. Yeah. So the the printout would be our signal we received at the start. There is this slight weirdness here of they've got a copy of part of it here from the Arecibo array but Mulder has to go to Arecibo there's no way of getting the rest of the signal up here I'm a bit confused we are working on Mulder logic here <laughs> we are and they bring up the wow signal which is a, a very it's an interesting quirk of radio uh, astronomy and is real and is real the 1977 wow signal which was uh, 30 times stronger than the background radiation and basically it's all been sort of provoked the reaction from the guy who found it just comment wow beside it in the margins because it was a signal unlike anything they'd sort of detected before it's often there are explanations for the wow signal yes. but people often take it as the best sign of extraterrestrial life yes and it's a, a decent jumping off point because of this uh, this episode of course has to have this signal you've got from our SIBO is even better i liked the grounding in real life projects in this as well because it makes reference to the seti project and yes. things like that uh, which, again, is real um, a real kind of um, scientific study into the possibility of extraterrestrial life. Absolutely. And also, um, Arecibo is, of course, a real location. Uh, uh, most no... seen in Goldeneye. Goldeneye. Yep. No longer in operation, sadly. But at the time, a lot of X-Files fans were very annoyed that Arecibo was depicted as a nickel and dime SETI project in a shed somewhere. Because it's an enormous dish, if you've seen Goldeneye, when they run across it. And it was an enormous research centre at yes, one point. It was a bus- at the time this episode was set, it was a bustling, very heavily trafficked, and a lot of people there. Your equivalent in the UK would be our George Roll Bank, but yeah, well, it's way bigger than George Roll Bank even, and things like that. And George Roll Bank is still going. I do like Scully's kind of cunning here, as well, though, afterwards, of... So she's got a list of where the other SETI projects are. She just cross-references those destinations with the itineraries of everyone who left Washington and finds one of Mulder's aliases. And amongst the names visible on the flight itinerary, a lot of them are apparently X-Files fans, but in amongst there you can see Charles Grant, who wrote the first two of the X-Files novels, which would be Goblin and Whirlwind, which we'll get to eventually. Uh, so there's some good tension, though, with sort of the build-up as night starts to fall at Arecibo, with the whole the signal is coming from close by, and um, sort of closer by than you'd think. This does lead into an interesting conundrum the X-Files has here. So <clears throat> this has been presented as a response from the aliens. For whatever reason, mm-hmm. they decided to respond uh, with a signal better than the WoW signal and this much more recent. So they're playing back the Grand Bandera Concerto, which at least imply, we're meant to take it as implied they've picked up Voyager. They just plucked the ship out of the air, out of space and played the record. And The only problem really is season one of the X-Files exists. Because we've got Conduit and Pilot where they're flying, they've flown down and p- plucked people off the Earth for whatever reason. We've got Fallen Angel where they've crashed. EB where we've pursued live ones running around on the surface of the planet. That's one. EB where a one crashed and we've killed the alien that was on board. And an earlier Maya flask where we have the fetus of an alien. I've pointed this out many times, though, is that we're not just dealing with one alien here That's as well. That's true. Based on what we've seen, <laughs> there are at least three or four distinct different aliens present here. So you don't know that the ones that have called back are the same ones that are abducting and kind of possessing teenagers, or the ones that are communicating through radio waves or crashed in Fallen Angel. You know, they could all be different aliens. They could. Well, though, we'd have to link these ones back to the. They're certainly the abduction as a lot, though, if they are the Samantha group, which is. You what don't implies. know they are. It's we implied. Don't. It's implied, and it's exactly are. the same effects. 
However, it is never. N- we still don't know what happened to Samantha. We don't even. know what happened to Samantha. And we've called what happened to Samantha in question because Mulder's memories aren't reliable. That's true. How do you want to classify the uh, <laughs> the ship that turned up in this episode, though? It's not. It's not the clunky one from Conduit, but it's not one of the sleek stealth ones either. It's the sorcery one from EBE, isn't it, though? We don't see the ship. You get the impression it with the lights that it's the sorcery one from EBE. It's possible. We get um, flickering lights, but we've, I don't think we've had that effect before with the, the strobing black and blue lights. No, I suppose not. But you see the bright white light in EBE. But yeah, so I don't know if it's going to we'll conclude it's an existing ship or a different set. I still reckon it's the EBE one. We know the EBE alien is humanoid, even though we don't see it. That's true. Because as you point out when we watch the episode, they're using kind of human hospital equipment in the room with it. Yeah. Which implies it's about the size and shape of a human, which would fit with the grey we see in this episode. That's true. And the one that Jorge draws. Mm. Good job he'd managed to draw that as well. Which means also it's not the invisible one from a Fallen Angel if Jorge's seen it. That's true. But it's also a case of... What would they do get a receiver? They would just probably stroll around there. Why not? You're the cockroach. You um, don't get to assume what they're doing. Oh, I, I know, I know. But Mulder has a big thing about the um, bandwidth the signals coming through on, which uh, the first signals imply it's out past the moon. And then the next signal was implying it's within lunar orbit. And then the last one is incredibly close, like literally miles away. Because, but they've already been here and landed. They've just flown off again to come back in again. You're the cockroach. I'm the you cockroach. You don't get to assume. Why was there not a Mothman episode of the X Files? That's a good question. I, I love that analogy from the Moth, that which I w- should have credited sooner is actually from the Mothman prophecies as well, where he comments on something like "You're more advanced than a cockroach," but you've, have you ever tried explaining yourself to one or something like that? Yeah. With the idea of um, the aliens might not make sense to us, but it's because they're so more advanced than us. Then why would they even think of explaining themselves to an inferior creature? Indeed. Which is always an idea that's resonated with me and I quite like is you try to kind of apply reason to things like the X-Files episodes, but at the end of the day, they're far more advanced than us. Why would we understand this? Well, it's very true. Um, I, I do kind of like, though, uh, Mulder trying to do the Scully autopsy thing with no tools and just managed to do, to do observations. And then he goes off to his weird spiral about how it has faith in everything. The quote I do like, though, is when he says, before he could only trust himself, now he can only trust you. Which is kind of nice. To Scully. To yeah. Scully. And also, what would I do if they really came? Which we do see, and it's freak the hell out and try to shoot them. It's Good first of, contact. The whole bit with Mulder alone before his first contact is um, very Colonel Kurtzy as well, with him just kind of going slightly insane by himself in the jungle and getting increasingly paranoid. So it's kind of, in a way, a good job um, Scully is there for him and he still recognises Scully as being there for him because yeah. it's stopping him from going full <laughs> Colonel Kurtz. Oh, yeah. Also, just when the abduction, or well, the wannabe abduction starts because they don't float him out the structure, which they could totally do. I don't see why they couldn't float Mulder out the building. But, you know, as soon as the, the door flies open and the white light comes up, he freaks out immediately and tries to barricade himself in. I, and as you said it before, it's the whole curious about the paranormal but when you're actually face to face with it and you know there is no one with you and they are light years beyond your capacity and you realize that you're alone and vulnerable like yeah that. in case of yeah it's that idea so with um wanting to know the truth and actually finding it well i think the atmosphere doesn't help given you've got a storm raging and then you've got the tape player slurring words out really eerily and the fact it's starting to pick up his dictaphone notes and everything and play them back to him mm. Uh, it's, it's all very sinister and very creepy. So it's, it's good X file stuff, that's for sure. And then there's a dancing alien. And then there's a dancing alien. So, <laughs> moving past that, of course, we get the barest hint that Mulder might be undergoing natural alien abduction because you see like the light moving above him before it sort of focuses in its scully. So I think there's meant to be that insinuation at first, case of. Holy shit, is he actually getting the whole abduction? You have the idea of Mulder's kind of mental state, though, as well, is that this might not be what we're experiencing. Because, you know, the military are moving in, there's a storm. Yeah. There's a possibility that it's Mulder's heightened level of stress is he's kind of hallucinating this is an extraterrestrial experience when it's actually something you can explain. Yeah. That the dancing alien is actually Scully coming <laughs> to the building and um, the lights are the helicopters or the storm or something like that. That's a good point. 
And that's through drama because then Mulder gets into giddy giddy schoolboy mode when he's like, "Ah, oh, it's all evidence." Case of the body, more evidence. It's Mulder. That's a dead body. Jorge will be able to tell you very little about aliens. And we can't get it out of the country. <laughs> I like when Scully has to explain how are we going to get that out of the country. You can't put him in a suitcase. We could have Bernie's two style. But yeah, and it's also Mulder makes the wrong call when pushed when the um, crash retrieval team are actually approaching. In this case, we should have taken the printouts. Again, I don't understand how Matheson can have some of them and not all of them. Then he goes for the tapes, which have... I don't know, it's it's interesting query of, did the tape, as you said, how much of this is delusion? Did the tapes actually record anything at all when um, when he was listening to them? Has he imagined it all and were they really wiped out by the I storm? I do think it's Mulder misremembering um, Samantha's abduction puts anything else he w- kind of perceives into question. If there's not a second person there to verify it, you wonder how much is Mulder imagining, Mulder's paranoia, uh, Mulder overreacting perhaps to what he's seen or something like that. Yeah. Is we can't say for sure that those tapes were even ever recorded. Exactly. And I just realised you could make the point of of him saying the tape recorded the Brandenburg Concerto coming from space. But you've just listened to that twice over in Matheson's office. You know full well it's the first track on the Voyager gold disc. You're not going to plug this bit of music out the air. Yeah, I think like Mulder, everyone wants to kind of think they've found a piece of the truth and this is something that's actually happened. But I think there's so much in this episode that just calls all of that into doubt. Absolutely. Also... You could actually make the argument as well of, is this thing staged somehow? Because the Blue Beret are meant to be a elite team of military people who do crash retrieval, apparently. Mm-hmm. They're useless. These are two FBI agents in a truck who completely outdrive them. And completely fail them. every stealth roll yeah. using my D&D analogies. Yeah. Drive yeah. straight down a hill, get out from a, a group of people who are apparently meant to know what they're doing and be very good at their jobs. And no... We know that it's not above this kind of shadow government to fake things as well because of the um, faked alien transport from EBE. Yeah. But they definitely do shoot more than Scully because they, they, I don't know, they don't think they even shatter the back window of the car. Was it, is it all just a front to sort of make more to believe in things? Or are you getting paranoid now? Ooh. So it turns out that if you'd actually looked at the outside of our SIBO, there's actually like strobe lights set up all around the outside. Yeah. Two people on either side of the building just shaking it slightly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it turns out they're actually all false walls. You can just knock the whole thing sideways. I mean, that's why Jorge is in the bathroom all day. He's a paid actor. No, I think we're going to take it as serious. But yeah, well, then we get the nice um, team with Skinner and um, Cancer Man where Skinner oddly sides with Mulder, which is... Mulder doesn't seem to take on board that Skinner's on his side. Well, he wouldn't. He's decided the skin is the enemy. <laughs> I know. I think it goes back to the whole, he's not got into the Scully thing of evidence yet of, yeah, Skinner has your back on this one. He sort of, by all rights, should throw the book at you because you've sort of been insubordinate and run off without authorization to go to Puerto Rico or all the other places. Cancer man's gloating that you've got nothing. Skinner is willing to help you out within reason so long as it won't put himself in danger, I think. Yeah, and Mother's just, yeah. In the position he's in, Skinner can't go full Mulder. No. But believes in you and is trying to support you in what way he can. Yeah, and it's also, he does, I think they, they make, is it this one or the next one they make? No, it's the next one they make mention of the X-Files. And he's kind of got a grudging regret that it was closed down. Mm. It's still very odd it's come under his, uh, his section of the FBI, but do you have anything else about this episode? Because I think we've gone through most of it. The final point of Little Green Men, thankfully, is also a really optimistic note. Yes. Which is that is um, as depressed as Mulder was at the start of the episode and not sure where he's going from here, he now has accepted he has his work, he has Scully, and he has himself. So there's hope. Yep. Potential bright future for him and Scully and his quest. Which is what you really need in the first episode of a season. Yep. And uh, like I said, as, as a starting point of a pilot. So this is you setting everything up to go forward again. I do wonder how many of those alien types from the first season are ever going to come back again, if any. Space Ghost? I want another Space Ghost episode. Invisible aliens? Yep. Shape-shifting Amish people? No, gender-flipping Amish people, not shape Yep, gender-flipping Amish people, I apologise. Okay, so our second episode of the week is The Host. 
first broadcast on the 23rd of September 1994, directed by Daniel Sackheim and written by Chris Carter. Our guest stars are an actual kind of a weird bunch this time. Principally, we have Darren Morgan, who will recur one more time in the X-Files in Small Potatoes as Eddie Van Blunt. However, he is best known in the X-Files for being a writer, having contributed to one episode in Season 2, multiple episodes in Series 3, one episode in Series 10, and one episode in Series 11. Matthew Bennett, who played Craig, who was the uh, worker who got bitten, is in Orphan Black as Daniel Rosen, who I've forgotten who that is, but he was in Due South twice as Jack Goody and Spatial Agent Casey. We also have Stephen Williams, who wouldn't give the character name yet, given we know he's going to be an ongoing guest star for a while, but he's a voice on the phone, and that's all we're safe now. He's in multiple future episodes, but of other things you'll have seen him in, He's in the Blues Brothers as Trooper Mount, who I think is one of the pair of policemen who John Candy gets to help him out. He's in Jason Goes to Hell as Crichton Duke. He's in 22 Jump Street as Captain Adam Fuller. It's been too long for since I watched 22 Jump Street. Uh, he's in It Part 1 as Leo I. Hanlon. Who's Mike's father. Yep. And he's in Birds of Prey as Captain pa- Patrick Erickson. And I'd completely forgotten what was in there. Oh, sorry, not Mike's father, Mike's grandfather. Mike's grandfather, but it's not one of the Hammond family. Mm-hmm. And we also have, and I've got to do this one, Ron Salvray, who plays Ray in this episode, and who also come in season three in what is generally considered one of the worst episodes of The X-Files. Desos Despichos. Oh. <laughs> I've managed to block out Desos Despichos. I'm sorry, but Re- um, he will appear in that episode as well. Uh, poor and, man. Poor man. A note, though, and it could be my search history, but it does seem to be consistent across all of them, is all these bit parts, if they're not on Wikipedia, if you look up them on IMDb, the photo at the top of their page is always of the X-Files. <laughs> For these pe- pe- people, apparently the X-Files is the pinnacle of their careers or always listed on the top pictures. It's great. Glad to hear it. Would you like to do the synopsis for The Host? I will do my best. Our cold open this time takes place on a Russian freighter which is just off the coast of New Jersey. A younger crewman is forced to make repairs to the ship's overflowing toilets, much against his will, and is pulled into the septic tank. Some time passes and his body is found in the sewers of Newark. Mulder is assigned the case by Assistant Director Skinner. Mulder is really down on this. He thinks this case is just a mob hit and it's beneath him and thinks that Skinner is just trying to find further ways of punishing him. Scully tries to get him to think more positively about this and offers to autopsy the body for him, hoping that she can kind of pick up Mulder's spirits because at this point he's on the verge of quitting the FBI. Uh, Evidently, things have not got better for him since Little Green Men and his positivity from the end of that episode seems to have already gone. When Scully does the autopsy, uh, she finds a tattoo written in Russian language on his arm that she doesn't translate at this time. She also finds a very large fluke worm inside his liver. Later in the episode, she reveals that those fluke worms only usually grow to be a few centimetres, but this one's about a foot long. Meanwhile, in the Newark sewer system, a city worker, as Nick said earlier, whose name is Craig, needs to be rescued when he's attacked by something that he believes to be a python and pulled under the water. He visits the doctor, who gives him antibiotics for the horrible things he swallowed, and examines his back where he thinks the python has bitten him. There is a very large round wound on his back that does not resemble a snake bite, but the doctor believes that it might be some kind of bite, although they can't identify it. When Scully later tells Mulder about the fluke that she found in the Russian guy's liver, Mulder realises that they have a similar kind of mouth part, although the thing that bit Craig is much, much bigger. Later that night, Craig does die in the shower, quite graphically after coughing up another of the fluke worms. Mulder visits the sewage processing plant and speaks to both Ray, the foreman there, and Charlie, who is an elderly sewage company worker. The three of them, while investigating the sewage processing plant area, discover a large humanoid creature crammed in the tank uh, that does have a kind of fluke worm-ish mouth. Meanwhile, while working at Quantico, someone shoves a newspaper article under Scully's door but runs away before she can see who it is. The newspaper article gives her the information she needs to realise that the writing on the 
um, corpse's arm is actually his own name in Russian. This, in turn, allows her to identify the body and realise where he came from. Mulder and Scully reconnect, and Mulder shows her the flukeman who they now have in captive. Skinner is determined to prosecute the creature and subject it to psychiatric evaluations, but Mulder thinks that the flukeman is more of an animal and this will be impossible to do so. Regardless, they start to transfer the creature under Skinner's instruction to an appropriate psychiatric facility. However, when the creature is transported by the van to the psychiatric facility, it manages to slip through its restraints because its body is very slimy and presumably kills the driver of the van. We don't really see what happens. It's off screen. Meanwhile, it scampers away to a local camping site and hides within a portable toilet, somehow knowing that it will be gathered by a sewage vehicle which will transport it back to the sewage plant. The creature's end goal appears to be getting back to sea. Mulder receives a call from a mysterious man who tells him that the X-Files must be reopened and also that he has a friend at the FBI. Um, Scully later connects this to potentially being the person who slipped the paper beneath her door earlier. Scully has also investigated the flute worm she discovered earlier and realised it's a larvae. From this, she decides that the fluke man itself, the humanoid creature, must be attempting to reproduce and this is how it does it by biting other people. Mulder realises what the creature is intending to do and that they can't allow it to get back in the sea and lose it. They need to dispatch with it now. Mulder and Ray pursue the creature down into the sewers. They don't see any sight of it, but reach the storm drain, which is open. They try to shut this, but in doing so, Ray falls into the sewage water and is attacked by the flukeman. Mulder dives in after him and manages to save him and also closes the door of the storm drain in the nick of time, slicing the flukeman in half. As the two of them um, conclude what they have discovered over the episode, Scully hypothesises that the Russian freighter was hauling salvage material from Chernobyl, and therefore the creature was possibly created in some kind of radioactive slurry that they were transporting. Mulder also speaks with Skinner, who reveals the fact that he is not really Mulder's enemy, although Mulder doesn't see it that way. Skinner is doing everything he can within his power to help Mulder, which included putting him onto this case, although Mulder didn't realise it was an X-Files at first. Skinner identified it as such, and Skinner is trying to help him in what little way he can. Meanwhile, in the final sting of the episode, we see the upper half of the Flutman's body floating out to sea, and its eyes open. Listen to the synopsis, I had the realisation that we are kind of... Well, it's a good episode, I would actually say, Chris Carter doing a good one again. At the same time, we're kind of treading water because Mulder's already backslid from Little Green Men. Yeah, I thought that when we watched these two episodes back to back is that Little Green Men ends so full of hope and Mulder's immediately, that's it, I'm quitting the X-Files by the start of the next episode. I mean, there's commentary on uh, Little Green Men, how it was going to be Chris Carter writing it and then it got reassigned to Morgan and Wong. And it seems that Chris Carter didn't actually sort of rewrite the episode to take Little Green Men into account and basically, this is how we're going to open this season anyway. Then again, Chris Carter was also going to send Mulder to Moscow for the series opener, which would have been a very different kind of opening. I think Arecibo is a bit cooler. Yes. I did forget to note before as well, it was based on, partially based on an unmade script that Morgan had written many years ago by a man who went down to a Mexican telescope. Okay. That's the only detail that's given about it, and basically parts of it were cannibalized into Little Green Men. But anyway, so <laughs> also, this episode, I like it, but it's also weird as hell. It's great. It's utterly, utterly revolting and great body horror. It's an absolutely fantastic Monster of the Week episode. Did you happen to pick up where the inspiration for it came from? Go on. Uh, Chris Carter's dog had worms. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I like that's it. all you need to know, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Anyone who's experienced a pet with worms, it's like, yep, understand. Yeah, it's totally. absolutely horrible. I don't like this at all. <laughs> the biggest laugh, I think, when we, when we watched the episode was when Sc- Scully figured out what the tattoo was and it's, Dimitri, you have a tattoo of your own name on your arm. It's handy for identification purposes. <laughs> it is, but who has their own name tattooed on their arm? I mean, I think also you had that trivia that the engine room of the freighter is a... It's a hydroelectric power yeah, plant. Yeah. That they, d- they couldn't find a boat to shoot it on, mm. so it is. It, it's convincing. You oh, believe yeah. it was the engine room of a boat. Oh, yeah. But it it's is all... a hydroelectric power plant. I mean, I... I'm not sure where I got hold of the idea, but I'm certain the first time I watched it, that cold opening was missing. 
Oh, really? Yeah, I can't remember if that's because I watched someone I taped it off Sky because a friend of mine used to do that for me, or it's because it generally was broadcast without the cold opening. But yeah. I know they had some Fox censorship issues with the episode, but it was primarily for Craig's rather horrible death. Yes, is Fox did not want to show him coughing up the fluke worm. I think there was speculation the BBC would cut it as well, and it didn't actually happen. It's not overly graphic. It does cut away. You don't actually find out he's died until later no. in the episode. But <laughs> it is remarkably unsettling to see him cough up a foot-long flute worm. It is. And I, I kind of like also the neat little um, nods they've got of the whole... This apparently leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth. It's not just because you've sort of accidentally swallowed sewer water. It's like intrinsically this is doing something nasty to the back to taste in your mouth. With the whole sort of, he tries to throw the gum, then he just starts squirting toothpaste into his mouth. I think it's more akin with like the xenomorph in Aliens. Yeah. Is when you've got the weird set of symptoms before that kind of chest burster comes out. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised that was an influence. I think it's particularly in the fourth one where the guy's getting blood in his mouth beforehand and things like that. You've got that idea of it slowly affecting you and then you hook up a fluke worm. (laughs) Yeah. Which is really, really horrible. It's kind of cute though. I I do like the little (laughs) fluke worm in a jar. I I think it's quite sweet. I'd keep one as a pet. Well, I mean, it, as long as it doesn't grow up to be, you know, Darren Morgan size, I think you're okay. They called the actual Flute Man monster on set Fluky, which yeah. I think is kind of adorable too. I mean, there is also the nepotism involved because this is uh, Glenn Morgan's brother. As Darren Morgan. Yep, as yeah. Darren Morgan. I didn't realise they were the same Morgan. Yeah, the same Morgan. That's how. That's how, Darren Morgan, who we will be discussing an awful lot later on, um, got his break on the X Files by playing Fluke Man. It's like one of the weirdest paths in you could ever imagine. That prosthetic is incredible. I was oh, looking, yeah. <laughs> I was looking a little into how they made it and things like that because apparently it had to be remade every day because it wasn't actually waterproof. Yeah, it was dissolving. But it also took six hours to apply and he had to wear it for 20 hour stints, during which he could not eat or use the bathroom very easily. Yeah, it's awful. But it looks incredible. Oh, it does. There's, there's a nice story as well, though, where apparently he did talk to Dave Jacovny quite a bit on set. But Jakovny never realised who it was. So when he came in as a writer later on and more involved with the maker of the show, they had, um, Jakovny had no idea they'd actually met him before. Oh, shows how good the prosthetics work is. I like uh, one interesting part of the, the episode, though, is you kind of get a sense of why the FBI is down on Mulder, given that he's really embarrassing to the FBI hierarchy at the start of the episode. Because he, he storms back from Newark. Storms onto Skinner's office, demands to be let in, and then he discovers then that Skinner's in the middle of a meeting <laughs> with some other head on to his... And continues to say, this murdered case is beneath me. Because, <laughs> yeah. Mulder, do you think there's a reason why you got reassigned off of your passion projects? <laughs> this doesn't look good from any kind of corporate oversight. Again, it made me think of the Simpsons X-Files episode where Scully kind of mentions terrorists and whatever else does she look at. And Mulder kind of says, I hardly think the FBI would be interested in that. <laughs> exactly. It's very much the Mulder of this episode. Oh, yeah. We will have to do the X-Files episode as a one-off at some point and possibly the reboot episode, which I know you haven't seen that one. Oh, the reboot. Reboot the animation. Reboot the animation, yeah. Ah, okay. It was a, and they got Julian Anderson in for that, I think. That's not, impressive. Not David Duchovny, but Gillian Anderson, I'm pretty sure, was on was mm. guest starring as a voice. And it was, it was like Fax Modem and Data Molly or something were the two of them. As you would. And it was just, why are you even here? <laughs> I know it's funny, but what's going on? I do like Scully being kind of trying to be the helpful person. Sort of, again, it's the whole, this doesn't follow from Little Green Men, where Scully's trying to bu- buoy up more the spirits by saying, there's an autopsy she's done, isn't there? I can do the autopsy. I can find out what's there to be found. She's she's really pushing to help Mulder, and he's kind of going, eh. can't be bothered. It's obviously crime, drug-related or whatever. It must be hurting Scully to see Mulder being so unlike himself, though. Because, oh, yeah. I mean, seeing Mulder so down, so close to giving up, when he's usually so passionate. Yes, and has been... She's just doing everything in her power just to kind of bring him back. And what do you know? She finds something. But that's after the a pretty decent horror sequence because again, I think in con- contrast to some of the monsters of the week previously, is they're pretty good with keeping the fluke man off screen as much as possible. 
you don't really see him until Mulder actually catches him. Yeah, I think that's the first time you get a clear shot of him because everything I'm else I'm not is sure you ever see his entire body either. He's always kind of in the water or in shadow or something like that. I think very, very briefly as he's climbing into the storm of an outlet, mm. but it's a very quick shot. But yeah, you've got great things like this being attacked underwater. I mean, it is hilarious when he sort of speculates it could be a, a, a python. In this case of, uh, you haven't actually met pythons, have you? <laughs> a boa, bit more likely, but still unlikely. Uh, pythons do get really big. You're thinking of my snake, who isn't very I big. Am. But um, at the same time, there is a big difference between a large snake holding onto you and something that has four limbs. Yes. You, you, you think you'd sort of know a bit more, obviously, it was a humanoid shape in there. Mm. I do kind of like the um, after Mulder's going meat as well. He says he doesn't want to tell Skinner that um, the suspect is a giant blood-sucking worm before finding out, yes, the suspect is a four-limbed giant blood-sucking worm. But they do have physical evidence. Skinner, do. Skinner doesn't try to deny this in any way because Skinner has his physical evidence. I think it's great because it's, Skinner has that meeting with Mulder sort of saying, you're not reacting the way I thought you would, sir. And he said, I reacted the way you thought I would this morning when I read the report. Now I'm going to do about your your behaviour. I like It's sort of Skinner's unflappability of, yeah, I had my freak out this morning. I'm past that part now. <laughs> it must now become the um, dread of whatever Mulder can bring. It's not the humanoid fluke worm. <laughs> it's going to be a low point. <laughs> Although, again, I think it's like the existence of Luke, man, even though you've lost the body, you actually have got legs still. So you've got some material evidence of it. Mm. You've got whatever was recorded of it at the um, facility when they first incarcerated it. That's got to provoke a lot of really awkward questions in sort of biological sciences and things. It's unprecedented, really. Yeah. Because you've got this thing that has both parasite and human physiology. Yeah, in this case of... And I understand why I haven't done it, because this is a serialised TV show that's focused on one thing, but it's a case of, this should derail Scully's career in such a way, and derail more than Scully, derail everyone's career in this case of, yeah, we're going to spend years speculating on what the hell happened here and how how it happened, and, and exploring, are there any more of them? Well, Scully's theory that it came as a result of Chernobyl yeah. is, let's get over <laughs> there and investigate this. Exactly. It's one of those whole... This is a problem with episodic TV in some ways, a whole... We've sort of set this up mm. and we cannot linger on it because we have to move on to something else. In science terms, you are getting into your weird science of the 50s with this, though, as well. Yeah. With radiation can do whatever <laughs> you want it to do. The Marvel superhero stuff. Human worm hybrid? Sure, why not? It's something they're looking in the most recent Digimon game, Digimon Survive, is to entirely spoil the game for everyone. Depending on what ending you get as well, by the end of that, the entire world is aware of Digimon and it has fundamentally changed everything. Yeah. So depending on how bad an ending, it is like cataclysmic world event or it's something whereby um, the certain people who are, were already aware of Digimon are trying to help other people adapt because they're aware that some people will react with violence to this revelation and things like that. So that's how you write in your world changing events. Yeah. Is it's got to be something that fundamentally changes science for everyone. Yeah. Don't take that into account. You're doing something wrong. Which I understand the X-Files will come back to this in the comics. And from what you've said, not uh, in a good way. Hosts. Yes. One day, I am, when we've finished all these episodes in the far future, I am going to talk about the graphic novels. <laughs> but the X-Files series 10 comic, I think, actually did have a sequel story following on for this with what happened to the Flukeman after host. In which case he decided he'd go on holiday to Martha's Vineyard and start abducting people to incubate his young. But into that, it does show you the origin of the fluke man as well. Indeed, he was created in Chernobyl when a man fell into a vat of radioactive flurry gestating the first fluke man, which gained his physiological things, because that's how evolution happens. Absolutely. You fall into a radio vat that liver fluke you already had therefore evolves into a human alien hybrid because apparently we're working on toxic crusader sort of logic here <laughs> i should probably note that there is also a um, young adult novel of the host as well it's another one that's worth reading because it's a les martin one most hysterically it gives kind of backstories for the russians on the freighter at the start and oh, also ray ray gets a lot more kind of backstory in there as well because oh, yeah. Les Martin likes his little NPC backstories. 
I, I liked Ray. I mean, Ray is, and it was an interesting casting because he's really personable, really fast, and he's got a nice buddy thing going with Mulder. He's totally open to it as well. It's like, um, yeah, we're hunting this weird monster in the sewer. Oh yeah, there are weird things in the sewer, and he just yeah. runs with it. Some mysterious figure who talks to Mulder on the phone slips a um, what's very clearly a um, gossip rag under Scully's door, which makes me think very much of Men in Black. When they go to the, he goes to the newsstand, this case of the best investigative journalist yeah. in America, and this is before that. So this Men in Black may have taken this joke from the X Files, but it's the National Comet, I think, is the um, newspaper, and it's the thing about the monster on the boat. And all, it's another thing that should provoke reaction of case of, surely, guys, this newspaper you now know is correct. Do you not talk to them about where they got their story from? Who talked to who, and where? Where did this? Where did you get any of this from? Because they just kind of just again, it's just a stepping stone for them figuring out that Dimitri has his own name tattooed on his arm, which I'm never going to be over, really. Dimitri, come on! Maybe it turns out Dimitri also has a boyfriend who's also called Dimitri, and it's just one of those happy coincidences. Okay, I'll I'll take that one. (laughs) Maybe. Well, Skinner wants the Flukeman to stand trial, which is absolutely hysterical. But we're gonna we're gonna try that anyway. Uh, and they transport the Flukeman, and it's just one guy with an ambulance with the weird Groshnetti monster tied up in the back. So okay, I can buy Flukeman slips his bonds because he's only held in for this few straps, and he is really slimy. But I think, as you note at the time, where is he? Because he just vanishes into thin air. Now, I'm going to put this to anybody listening to this. Tell me where the flukeman is hiding <laughs> in that picture. Because I can't see him. I can't see anywhere he's hiding. Yet as soon as the guy turns around, he's right behind him. Yeah, but we don't see that, though. We just hear him get attacked from outside. Mm. But it means it's got to be right behind him. Because it's as he turns back to the door, you get the view from outside. Yeah. So he is somewhere in the back of that ambulance. But where he is... Well, he, he's not on the ceiling. It doesn't look like he's under the stretcher. Uh, he's not under the little benches because we no. look under there. There's no way he could possibly fit in any of the cabinets. So where is the fluke man? It, it, it's been driving me mad, and I've re- even read the novel and cannot figure out where the fluke man is hiding. He's a good... The novel even draws attention to him checking under everything, and the fluke man still jumps out and grabs him by the neck in the novel version. But it's quite impressive. And then we get the um, slightly weird bit where he drags himself to the portaloo and then down into the presumably um, oh septic tank. Septic tank. Which is huge, uh, and it's one of these things where I think oh, what we, we watched uh, that film Spell, where they've got an actual privy set up, and that's literally just you know a hole into a, another hole where all the sewage goes. Yeah, pretty sure that's not how portal loops usually work, which is how the episode depicts it here. I'm going to go with my tombs logic again. Of I'm pretty sure that toilets aren't just chutes that go straight down. There's some plumbing there, and I, know, if, I flush or something. Yeah. If I could not suspend my disbelief far enough that tombs could slip through one of these, that fluke man is not going through. No, with all his bones. And the fact that he just sort of gets in there, and then the guy who comes in the next morning to pump out the sewage, shoves it straight down the toilet bowl <laughs> through a tube. The Flukeman is probably twice the width of, at best. He's not a small monster, no. the He just sucks him up into the sewage tank. And I understand for the whole, we've got to get the episode moving, but you're looking at it going, what is going on? <laughs> How does any of this work? I get the sense that they kind of like the sewage treatment as a set because they've got all those long shots of them just looking in empty tanks trying to spot Flukeman. Uh, those bits were actually um, filmed in a real sewage treatment plant as well. It's just the bits in the sewer themselves that they built a set. Indeed, it was uh, Chris Carter's dad who helped them build the set because he is a builder, apparently. Yeah, which is an uh, interesting um, family connection. We're going to hope that Ray can be treated for his liver fluke before it consumes him. That would be sad. I presume that you can treat it. Yeah, well, I'm much because I mean, with any real. kind of like anti-parasitic because yeah. it is essentially a fluke a very big fluke worm yes so i'm yeah i'm gonna be optimistic we don't hear that ray dies he's probably okay this is good you're not you don't even see if he gets bitten to be honest he's just kind of grabbed by it yeah it, it, the back of his shirt looks a bit bloody but it's not clear if he's actually had the bite thing mm. which seems to be the way it transmits its young in i think a way that nothing is ever reproduced <laughs> ever well i think this comes under your whole your heading of vampires but not normal vampires again yeah, it's something I, I'm keeping an eye out on the X-Files is 
There are so many different vampire stories because I still maintain tombs as a vampire story. So is the host. But more often than not, the X-Files gets around its vampires by kind of making them a bit weird. Yeah. As again, that's the whole... Like, yeah, he's a vampire that eats livers yeah. or something like that. Yeah, this is why we kind of bag on shapes quite a bit because it's not doing this to werewolves. It's just a straight werewolf story. Yeah. It's kind of interesting when X-Files does its monster with a twist ones because it keeps you guessing a bit more. Yeah. I mean, you can't say, oh, it's X. And you can't go down the route of, well, it's a vampire, so obviously it will be weak to sunlight or something <laughs> like that. You've got to find your other ways to defeat this. Yes. Do you have anything else for this episode? No, our oh. episode for host ends again with another sting that leaves it so we could bring the Flutman back. Unfortunately, we never do in the series. We know, as we've just said, it's just in the graphic novel that Flutman gets his sequel. And possibly they should not have done that either. Yeah, it's... <laughs> One of the reasons I read the season 10 was because I wanted to read the host sequel because this episode holds up for me. I remembered it being a really good episode and it is a really good Monster of the Week episode. And unfortunately, I wish I hadn't read hosts, to be honest. <laughs> oh, well. One day, one day I will go through all the graphic novels with people and tell you why I generally don't like them. So anything else for this episode? No, that's everything. Well, you know what you've got to do now. Oh, I get a conspiracy corner. You do. So, um, again, we've got some conspiracy to go. And we go to Kim's Conspiracy Corner. In our opening for season two, we actually do get to see the aliens a bit closer. Specifically, this is the first time we have actually physically seen one of the grey aliens in the series beyond the fetus that may or may not be real that Scully finds at the end of Earl and Mayer Flask. I say may or may not because Nick and I still do not agree on this subject. The grey aliens are seen both in flashback and in Mulder's experience in Arecibo. The only small downer of this episode is the fact that we're always from Mulder's perspective and therefore we're not sure how much of it is his own paranoia his stress, his false memories of what may have happened to Samantha. Based on what we do see, it's a continuation of the abductions that we have previously seen in episodes such as Conduit and the original pilot. So we actually see one of these abductions firsthand now, and it's much like they've been described previously. We see the bright lights, we see room shaking. The small differences that we do note in this episode is the aliens seem to have some kind of telekinetic power of some kind. They can move objects remotely, including opening doors. They are also capable of affecting radio equipment. This might feed into a bit more the way the aliens we saw in Conduit, as they certainly were able to project kind of wave patterns and thoughts into people's minds in that. But in this, we see them kind of using the similar power to play back the Brandenburg Concerto in particular on audio equipment. We see very little of the overarching conspiracy going beyond this however we get more of an impression of the fact that the shadowy government body that the councilman belongs to is part of the fbi or influencing it in some way but skinner is rebelling in any small way he can we also learn in host that Mulder does potentially have another informant at the very least he has a friend at the fbi though it's unclear in this episode if the person on the phone is referring to himself or if he's perhaps referring to Skinner, who is still doing his level best to help Mulder out. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add? I think that covers everything for now. We're not sure if we can link these aliens to anyone else yet. I think Conduit's our closest. Conduit's probably the closest, given that did um, Holy also revolve around Samantha to a large degree. You've got Conduit and also possibly Earl and Mayor Flask, if that fetus was genuine. Yep. And uh, I think we do also have to put a note on um, Mr. and Mrs. Mulder's hearing and vision, given that this happened next door. I'm going to go, we know the aliens, <laughs> no, well, we, we don't know that. the aliens are psychic, but a lot of the aliens we've seen seem to have some kind of psychic powers. So I'm going to go with this is localised and it's not affecting a large area. You're experiencing it like if you're directly under it or something like that. That's true. Like, think of it, the cone of silence from Get Smart. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> See, the, the aliens. Um, Actually, the lowering, cone, the lowering the cone, the cone of silence. silence. That's why those little um, beam things you see in cartoony UFOs are always cone shaped. Oh, okay. 
You you realize, of course, the terrible thing you've opened up for now. Oh no! The aliens have shoe phones. Canon. <laughs> That's canon. Okay. Aliens have shoe phones. Not the aliens seem to wear clothing ever. But they'll have somewhere like shoe phone space to keep their shoe phones in. Why have they got shoe phones? Just because you don't understand their technology, Nick. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't. And I basically, I don't understand anything about the aliens in this series at all. They're really strange. And not in that Mothman way either, in the case of what the hell is going on. All will come clear or not in the passage of time. Okay. I think that's everything we've got for this week. Yep. Okay. Uh, our email address, if you had to talk to us, and if you do know Catatonia, is things are getting strange42 at gmail.com. You can also reach me on our social media. Our Twitter and Tumblr usernames are GetStrange42. On Mastodon, we are at GetStrange42 at Universodon.com. And on Facebook, you can find us just by searching for things that are getting strange in X-Files Rewatch podcast. Again, if you do have access to either of the upcoming novels that I can't get, that's the one that covers Ascension and the one that I think is called Hunters, which covers Colony and Endgame. Please do hook me up. I cannot find them anywhere and I'd love to read them before we do the episode. Yeah, hopefully someone can help out. Our theme music is Envision by Kevin MacLeod. You can find that on Competech.com and it's licensed under the Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thank you for listening. Uh, next week we are watching Blood and Sleepless. If I remember right. And until next week, the, the truth, truth is, is out, out there. there.